Hello, and welcome to Friday STEAM. My name is Sandy Roberts, and I am the Makerspace Coordinator for the Warren County Library System. Oop, I'm turning down the volume on my phone, because <laughs> that's giving us a little bit of a trouble there. Um, but, hi, welcome to Friday STEAM. Um, every week we bring you science, technology, engineering, art, and math, all kind of brought together um, with some fun experiments and ways to learn um, and try something new. So this week, uh, we are actually going to be learning about the sense of taste. So we've learned about our sense of sight, we've learned about our sense of, I'm just gonna take these off, our sense of sight, we've learned about our sense of hearing, we have learned about our sense of smell, so today we're gonna to learn about taste and next week is a very special treat. We'll be learning about our sense of touch as we discover how humans sense in space because next week is space week and we have all kinds of fun activities planned for you um, along those lines. And of course it is Halloween uh, month so that's coming up and we have all kinds of fun Halloween stuff all month long including our October Spooktacular uh, book challenge, reading challenge. So if you go to warrenlib.org, and let me put that website up for you real quick. Uh, let's see if I can get it to do that. <laughs> warrenlib.org, you can register for Beanstack, which is what we use for our online um, reading programs. If you register for summer reading, you're already good to go. If not, go ahead and make an account, use your library card, it's really easy to do. So make sure you get involved in that and make sure you tune in next week for all of our fun Space Week challenges too. But let's get started with our um, topic for today. So as we learned last week, Okay, smell is one way that we interact with our world by actually taking in chemicals from different things and interpreting what they mean. Um, and we learned that our sense of taste and smell work really closely together to, um, making sure that the volume's up, I've been having some trouble with my sound, um, but we, taste and smell work together um, to give us the flavor of the food that we're used to eating. Um, and that's really important because as animals that eat food, we have to make sure we're not eating something that could hurt us, right? That could poison us or make us sick. So every animal has a sense of smell. We all vary a little bit in how we do it, um, but we also all have a sense of taste. And again, it varies a lot in how we do it, but they are really important senses and they're some of the most powerful senses that animals have. So why don't we learn some more? I'm gonna switch to my little presentation here, okay. Where is my window? <laughs> okay, so let's start with the obvious question. What is taste? So, um, oh, it still says what is smell, I apologize. Um, lots of typos, my bad. I did not do a good job editing this week, I apologize. But what is taste? So when you eat something, there are chemicals in it, everything is made of chemicals, and those chemicals are released. And your body uses special taste recep receptors uh, to actually know what those chemicals are. And we're gonna learn a little bit more about how that works. But it's very similar to smell. So taste is also called gustation, okay? And it is the detection and identification of dissolved chemicals. When we talk about things that are dissolved, you have a, uh, a solution being made where you have the uh, solute dissolved in the solvent. So the solute is like if you put a cup of uh, uh, sugar in your tea and stir it. The um, sugar is your solute and your solvent is your tea, technically. It's the water. Um, so usually in our mouth, that solvent is saliva and it's really important. We're going to talk more about that too. Anyway, all of this is another form of what we call chemoreception, which is just understanding chemicals, our brain's understanding chemicals. The difference is when we smell, that is distance chemoreception. This is contact chemoreception. We can't taste food that's not physically in our mouths, okay? Um, but when we eat, the flavor actually comes from a combination of the taste and the smell. So flavor is that coming together of two of our senses. And this little diagram over here shows you kind of what that looks like on a cellular level, where we have these receptors that take in the chemicals, these molecules all around us, and are um, changed as a result of that and that sends a signal to our brain. That's the basic process. Okay, so first step is chewing. Anytime we eat something, we chew it, usually. Um, now that chewing is important. In a beverage, okay, like a cup of coffee or a soda, 
all of that is already in solution, right? Remember I said it had to be dissolved? Well, that's already happened for us. But when we put a piece of food in our mouth, we need to break it down so that we can taste it. And we need to break it down so we can digest it. Chewing is actually the first step on the way towards digestion of our food. So um, we chew it into tiny pieces. This is also called mastication, which is a fun word, um, and it helps rele release what we call uh, tastants, which is basically a fancy word for uh, you know the molecules that we taste, the flavor molecules. Um, but there are a couple different steps that go into chewing. First off, you can feel, if you put your hands right here and move your jaw like you're chewing on something, you feel those muscles in your jaw, they're really strong. And you can see a picture of what they kind of look like. Your mandible is your jawbone, and up in here, it kind of has a rounded piece that fits into your skull. And there are really strong muscles that hold that jaw into your, onto your skull and allow you to move. Now, saliva, I mentioned, we need to dissolve our food, right? To be able to taste it and to digest it. So we have salivary glands. Some are right in here under um, at the root of our mouth, at the base of our mouth. And then we have some that are up in almost close to like our, um, our sinus cavity, which you might remember from last, year, last week. But they release saliva. And saliva has all this stuff called enzymes in it. Enzymes are like really special chemicals that break other things down. Um, so they're really important. We use them a lot in our body. Enzymes are kind of, you know, like they make all the chemistry in our body active, okay? Um, so there are lots of enzymes in our saliva, also known as spit. Um, and that's what helps to break it down. So when foods are mixed with saliva, they become hydrated. So all the important molecules for flavor are um, dissolved into the saliva so we can taste them, our receptors can taste them. And those enzymes go to work breaking it down so that we can digest it. Um, saliva also helps lubricate our food, so when we swallow it, it's easier to do. If you've ever like eaten like a really dry piece of toast and not chewed it all the way, you know how important that is, right? Okay, now, our mouth um, is actually really important for this process too because there are all, we have so many muscles. In fact, our tongue is just a big muscle, but we have muscles, and again, you can feel them when you move your mouth and your tongue. Your jaw muscles, okay, are voluntary, which means you get to choose if you're chewing, generally speaking, but they have a force. The adult molar teeth, which are the ones in back, okay, can exert 75 to 200 pounds per square inch of uh, force. So that's like imagining you take a 200 pound weight and drop it in a space of just one tiny inch. This might even be too big, one inch. So you're putting all that force in that tiny space. That's how strong your jaw and your molar teeth are working together, okay? And that's really important. That's how we grind, um, you know, a lot of vegetative matter. And if you've ever seen something like a cow sitting there and just kind of chewing on hay, that's what they're doing. They're using those back teeth to grind down a really hard substance. And let me tell you, their jaws are even stronger than ours. So don't go sticking your hand in, in a cow's mouth. I would be my recommendation. Anyway. <laughs> our incisors up in the front, okay, these are actually meant to cut our food. So they're like the knives in our mouth. And, um, and then we still have a little bit of the canines left. Um, and canines are kind of to tear at food. So if you've ever um, eaten a piece of beef jerky, right? Um, so that's kind of what they're there for. They don't exert quite as much pressure because they're a little more um, precise. They're supposed to be precise to kind of chop up your food. So your teeth are really important and they are part of the digestive system. Um, and they're really, uh, without good, healthy, strong teeth, it's much harder to digest your food. It's much harder to taste your food because you can't break it down. And the more your food is broken down, the more you release those um, tastants and the more you taste your food. All right, moving on to probably the thing we think of the most when we think of taste, our tongue, okay? So our tongue is an organ, just like your heart is an organ and your brain is an organ. It's a standalone, really important organ. Um, and it's made up of a group of muscles. So you can see here, your tongue is actually possibly a lot larger than you may realize. It's not just this, uh, that bit. It's got muscles that go down into the um, base of your mouth, okay? 
And you can see there's the base back here. You've got the tongue, the root of your tongue, which goes down into here. And again, you can kind of feel it. Um, and then you've got the tongue itself and it can touch the palate, okay, which is the top part of your mouth. Um, and so it's really strong. It's firmly attached. Um, it's really, really uh, strong. It's actually important that it's attached the way it is so that the tongue can't block our um, trachea or esophagus because that would cause us to choke or stop breathing. Um, the underside in a mammal is pretty smooth. You can probably tell that if you've ever reached in there and touched it. But the top is really bumpy, right? Have you ever really taken a look at your tongue? You should. Get, go out there and get the mirror. Really take a look at all the little bumps. They're not uniform. Okay, there are different types of bumps and we're going to talk about what they are because there are taste buds. Um, technically, they are called papillae, okay, are what the little bumps are called. They do come in different sizes because they do different things. Some are more sensitive than others. Um, most of them contain taste buds, okay, and taste buds are those taste receptors I was talking about. They actually have a tiny, tiny little microscopic hair that you can just barely see on this slide, this picture here. So these are your taste buds and they've each got a tiny little hair that sticks out. Those hairs are actually what send the message to your brain. And those hairs are what are able to figure out what the chemical is. It sends that information to your brain and your brain goes, do, 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 do. oh, I know what those chemicals all together are. Like I know that if I got this and this and this and this and this, that's an apple, okay? The average person has about 10,000 taste buds. Some people have more, they might have 12, 15,000. They're gonna have a more sensitive uh, sense of taste. So these are people that may be like chocolate tasters or wine tasters or chefs. Some people have less taste buds. And so they may not be as sensitive to food, which can be a good thing too. Um, as we age, our taste buds do they stop doing such a great job of reproducing. I mean, we generally replace our taste buds every two weeks or so, but that starts to slow down as we age, which is why a lot of folks, as they get older, do experience less taste, a loss of taste. And it's just because the taste buds can't quite replenish themselves as quickly. So sometimes you'll find folks um, as they age, they kind of go one of two ways. They look for spicier and spicier foods to kind of compensate, or they just get used to bland food and it tastes more to them because they have less taste buds. So don't go making fun of grandma for uh, enjoying her oatmeal every morning. For her, it probably tastes a lot more exciting than it does for you. Um, <laughs> so those are our taste buds. And here you can see what I mean, like that there are different sizes because they serve different purposes. But I, I really do encourage you, get out a, um, a lens if you have, like a, a microscope lens or any kind of a hand lens, get a mirror and really take a look at your tongue and take a look at those tiny little taste buds because everybody's got their own special arrangement and special number of taste buds. It is very unique to each individual. Okay, now how does all this get to the brain? Well, it's actually a little more complicated than it is with smell. Um, those, that little hair actually extends from the outer part of the receptor cell from the taste bud all the way through what's called a taste pore, which is kind of that cup-like thing that you saw in the last picture. Um, and the inner end actually connects directly to a sensory neuron. And a neuron is a nerve cell. Nerve cells are really important. We'll learn about them more next week when we talk about touch. But nerve cells basically um, communicate to the brain. Okay, so they do this through a complicated process of biochemical messengers, usually salts, okay, which is one reason that we need salts and minerals. Um, but they, they have this really complicated cascade, cascade of chemicals that sends messages and little electrical signals. All you really need to know right now is that each one of those little hairs is connected to a little nerve cell. Now, those nerve cells, those neurons, connect to one of three nerves um, that goes up to your brain. This is, again, a little different from smell. Remember, smell all goes into one olfactory nerve and up to the brain. In this case, your tongue actually has three different locations it can send uh, information through. Interesting. So we have the facial nerve, which you can see right here, okay, which actually runs from underneath and up. The uh, glossopharyngeal nerve, uh, which is actually towards the back, because this is your... Um, your, your um, esophagus and your pharynx, okay? And then the vagus nerve, which is right next to it, okay? So and it comes from further down your throat. 
So these three nerves run up to the brain and transmit the signals from those tiny hairs. And the brain goes, okay, that's this kind of chemical and I know what that is. And part of that is experience. Over time, you taste more things, you taste more combinations of things, and you can start to put all of that into you know, a database that your brain builds so that it understands what it is you're eating. And it starts to form preferences, like I like salty popcorn or I like sweet caramel popcorn. Okay, so over time, as your body categorizes all that, it's gonna develop preferences too. Okay. What about, oh, oh so what are these tastes? Well, we categorize them into five basic tastes. Okay, humans can sense, um, Salty, like potato chips, okay? Um, sweet, like honey and sugary things. Sour, like acid, um, think pickles, vinegar, lemon juice. Bitter, things like coffee or dark chocolate um, are bitter. And umame, um, this one is kind of recently discovered and some don't include it as a basic uh, taste, but they, each of these things is important for us for different reasons. We need to be able to find salt, and that used to be harder for, for beings, for humans, but we need salt because the salt ions, those chemicals, actually help our heart signal, our brain signal. We need it for all those, like I said, those nerve cells, they use that. We need it. Um, sweet is really all about the sugars carbohydrates form the basis of our diet evolutionarily. Um, so we were always seeking out sweet foods or carbohydrates. Now, this can be a bit of a backfire now because it's easy to get those things and it's easy to crave those things. And so many of us, myself included, tend to eat more carbohydrates than we really need to eat. So eventually we'll evolve. We won't you know, do that as much, but right now we have to be conscious of it. Um, sour and bitter are really there to warn us, to tell us, ooh, this is, this is probably not okay to eat. A very sour food may um, have what's called lactobacillus or maybe um, would have a lot of acid to it and could harm us. And bitter foods can also mask toxins. So traditionally, like evolutionarily, things like sour and bitter we'd be avoiding. But again, humans, being really smart, have found ways to use that in a way that's not harmful to us, like chocolate. Chocolate is technically bitter, but you throw enough sugar in there and it's pretty tasty, right? Okay, now umami is actually about amino acids. Believe it or not, we can't taste protein. So we can't taste the protein in something like chicken or an egg or fish or beans, or even mushrooms. We don't taste proteins. Um, what we do taste are the amino, amino acids that make up proteins. You can think of it this way. Proteins are basically, amino acids rather, are like Lego blocks, and when you put them together, you make the protein. So we can taste the amino acids when we break down that protein, when we break down the foods, those amino acids are released, and we can taste those. And that helps us know if we're eating you know, well, we want to crave protein. We need a certain amount of protein, right? So kind of interesting. And that's part of why we didn't really understand umame for a long time. Okay. This picture I think is really cool. Um, and it kind of shows the, the microvillae that I mentioned connected to these different um, receptors, to the different taste buds. Now, here's the thing. For a long time, it was thought that you could map out different tastes on the tongue. Like there would be a spot that really knew sweet, a spot that really knew salty, and that taste buds only tasted one type of thing and that they were grouped. The more we've studied, the more we've learned that isn't really true. Um, taste buds can actually sometimes taste multiple things. Um, they're grouped together so that they can taste um, salty and sweet together. And that's really important for the complex um, world of tastes that we need to understand so that we don't accidentally eat something that'll make us sick. Um, so our understanding is evolving a lot, but this kind of shows, I'm gonna put my glasses because I do need them a little bit, but this graphic right here shows um, the cell and those sensors that I mentioned, right, the nerves, and how there are many different types of the receptors all kind of grouped together.
there's usually a dominant taste that a receptor um, tests for, okay? Um, what's also interesting is that, for example, with sugars, we can't taste the difference between fructose and glucose necessarily, but we can taste how sweet something is. Like, kind of we can taste the amount of sugar in something, but not necessarily the individual sugars. So we rely on other chemicals to kind of get the idea of like, am I eating a piece of fruit or am I eating, you know, a piece of candy? All right. So it is, we're realizing much more complex than we understood. And that might be different from what your parents learned when they were in school. So this is exciting because one of the experiments we're going to do is going to be to kind of bust what your parents may have learned in school. Okay. What about other animals? We know about humans, 10,000 taste buds, lots of, uh, we really look for the sweet because that's what we eat, but other animals are different. <laughs> what I think is really interesting is that the animal on the planet that we have found to have the best sense of taste is in fact the catfish. You know, the big whiskery slimy fish that hangs out in the mud at the bottom of lakes and ponds. Catfish, fantastic taste, sense of taste. A hundred thousand taste buds. That's 10 times as many taste buds as we have. And they're not just in the mouth, they're all over its body. Those whiskery things are covered in taste buds. So a catfish can swim through its world and literally taste everything around it. And it needs that because if you are hanging out at the bottom of a lake where there's not a lot of light and you're a fish, so there's no air to breathe very easily, right? You're not like using your nose to take in lots of distance uh, chemo reception. You need a really good sense of taste to know, to understand your world because you don't have a whole lot of ability to see, right? You can't really smell. So you're going to rely on taste. And we find that a lot of aquatic creatures actually do have taste buds all over their bodies. So they they can taste through their skin or through their, you know, fingers or toes. Um, so it, it's, it's a totally different way of sensing the world, which I think is pretty cool. Now, speaking some terrestrial animals, most terrestrial animals have their taste buds securely in their mouths. And part of that's just because if you're running around a place where it could get freezing cold or sweltering hot, you want to keep your taste buds where they can be um, basically at the same temperature and moisture all the time. So you get a reliable reading of what you're, what you're experiencing. So for comparison, chickens only have about 24 taste buds. Most birds are about 20 to 30 taste buds. That's it. I guess they don't have a very complex sense of taste, but it gets them what they need, right? Mostly they're eating bugs or berries. Um, and the other thing about chickens, there aren't a whole lot of things that they eat that can make them sick, like really, really sick, just because of the way their digestive systems work. So they don't need a really complex sense of taste because there aren't a whole lot of things that are going to hurt them. Um, dogs have about 1,700 taste buds. Cows, pigs, very sensitive taste. They have more taste buds than we do. Um, cows, again, because they need to know that what they're eating vegetatively, right, isn't rotting and going to make them sick and has good nutrition to it, they need to be able to taste like really, really clearly whether or not something is decomposing. So we have found that most of the ability to taste really comes down to an animal's need to protect itself from the food it eats or to really focus in on finding the foods it needs to survive. For example, your cat really can't taste sweet. It doesn't need it. Cats don't rely on carbohydrates. They're carnivores. So because they mostly focus on uh, carnivores, they're mostly interested in salt and umami. They don't have a whole lot of sweet tasting um, <laughs> flavor receptors or taste receptors. So it's really interesting that depending on the environment, depending on the type of creature, that's going to decide what you taste. So what you can taste is really different than what your dog can taste. And you probably have noticed that because I've seen my dog eat some things that are pretty gross. All right, on to our experiments. Let's see, got to switch. Okay, going over to our document camera. Okay, so our experiments today, I've got three of them for you. And I want to make sure I'm keeping an eye on the time. Got about five minutes left. So um, our first experiment is to experiment with the idea that 
chewing and breaking down your food increases your ability to taste it. So very simple to do. Get a piece of fruit, like um, an orange is what I have. Um, apples work really great for this. And get a couple pieces of fruit and lick the fruit and see what you can taste. And it helps to have some water handy for this. Keep your mouth moist. Make sure it's fresh, but go ahead, lick your fruit. Okay, I can taste that it's an orange, but if I eat it, mmm, now I can taste the sweet. I can taste that little bit of acid. I get that orange flavor. So try that with a couple different foods and see how much of a difference chewing your food makes. Another thing to try is get some sugar, like your regular um, table sugar, you know, for baking. Get some powdered sugar that you might use for icing. Get some of the, um, that big crystal sugar that you might use for decorating and try each one going from the largest down to the smallest. Put the same amount on your tongue and see which tastes sweeter. In all likelihood, you're gonna find that the powdered sugar tastes sweeter simply because it's broken down more. It's a tiny particle and your body can sense it much more quickly and dissolve it into your saliva much more quickly. So that's another fun experiment to do. Okay, so that's our first one. Next experiment. Remember how I said that our sense of taste and smell are very closely related? Well, this is fun. I've got some cinnamon here, I've got hot sauce, and I've got some coffee, your cold brewed coffee. So what you're gonna do is get some really strong flavored things like this. You could try chocolate, vanilla, um, you know, ice cream. This is really fun to do with different flavors of ice cream or um, different flavors of herbal tea. If you still have your herbal tea from last week's smell experiment, so what you're gonna do is just use a popsicle stick or, you know, a little um, cotton swab, cotton bud, and you're gonna hold your nose and you're gonna try tasting it. It's even more fun if you blindfold everybody, hold your nose, and then have them taste something and see if they can figure out what it is. This is a really good, fun mystery game to play with your family or um, with your homeschooling pod or um, anything like that because it can be really funny. Without the sense of uh, smell, it can be really hard to know what you're tasting. We really rely on our sense of smell um, and those tiny particles as we put things into our mouth. Remember, all the little floating uh, particles that are being released from this coffee are going to go into my mouth and go into those receptors in my smell. And that actually works even faster than taste. So smell is really important. So if I hold my nose and I close my eyes, it does not taste like much. It certainly does not taste as good mm, when I can smell it. <laughs> For some adults, that smell of coffee in the morning, that's important. So that's another fun experiment. See if you can identify what things are when you can't smell them first. And again, make sure that you rinse your mouth between each one. Okay, last experiment. And this is the one I was talking about that your parents may have done when they were in school. It was a common experiment to show a map of where all the different tastes are supposed to be on your tongue and to get your little cotton buds. And I have here sugar, but you could use honey, anything like that. This is, oh, I'm sorry, this is salt. So you could use salt or you could use something that's salty like potato chips or, um, I don't know, what are some other salty foods, french fries. But potato chips are a good one. So that's salt, this is sugar. Again, you could use honey or you know any kind of sweet thing like that, candy. Um, but you want to try and keep it really simple to the sugariness. So like a lollipop might work or a hard candy. This is lemon juice. So lemon juice, vinegar, pickle juice, anything like that would be our sour. Here I have, this is baking chocolate, okay? So this is actually um, bitter and that works really nicely for bitter. You can also use, um, like the solid baking chocolate, but this is like baking powder, um, chocolate, what am I thinking? Yeah, um, cocoa powder, that's it, it's cocoa powder. So that works really nicely for bitter. And then this is actually soy sauce, one of the most famous umami uh, flavors out there. So your goal would be to dip, okay, into one of the flavors and try it at different spots of your tongue, like try it on the tip of your tongue. Yep, I can definitely taste the lemon juice. Then try it on the back of your tongue, carefully without giving yourself a gag reflex, right? I can still taste it, but it's not as strong. I'm gonna flip, 
Try it on the side of your tongue. Mm, definitely taste it there. And what about in the middle? Not as sensitive to it. But the point is, map out your tongue. Where do you taste things more strongly for each of these five fundamental flavors? So get out a piece of paper, draw a tongue or print one out, and test exactly where different flavors are sent strongly in your, on your tongue and where they aren't. If you do this for your whole family and sit down and compare, it can be really interesting to see how you all match up. You might also find that some of you are more sensitive to sour, some of you are more sensitive to sweet, um, and that can be really interesting because it's going to tell you a lot about your food preferences. One last factoid before we go. Some foods, genetically, we taste differently than others. Other people might. For example, the most famous is cilantro. This is an herb commonly used in Mexican cooking. But for some people, they have a gene mutation. That means in their DNA, that when they taste cilantro and sometimes other herbs like parsley, it tastes like soap. So it tells them, don't eat that. Um, we don't know why, <laughs> but it's a weird genetic quirk. So you might want to try some of that. There, are, Go online. You'll find that there are a whole lot of those kinds of uh, genetically linked food tastes. And you can try them out and see if anyone in your family has those interesting genes. All right, back over here. So I hope you enjoyed learning about taste with me today. Um, it certainly is a fascinating topic, especially when you start thinking about how it works with smell. Try those experiments. I would love to hear from you and uh, find out how it worked out. I'd love to see your tongue taste maps. Um, if you do that, you can share them oh, come on, on our Padlet, our digital wall. Padlet um, is a moderated wall that I check everything that gets posted. Okay, so you can share what you make or your experimental data um, with us and we would love to see that. And maybe you could share other, you know, see what other people are doing and enjoy their work too. So that's a safe, moderated place for you to do that. Okay, Whew. that was a lot today, wasn't it? Next week, we're gonna be talking about touch and how we sense things in space for Space Week. So I will see you next week at 3 p.m. here on Facebook Live for the Warren County Library System. Uh, come on back for Friday Steam every week with me, Sandy Roberts, the Makerspace Coordinator. Thank you so much for stopping by today. Stay safe, stay healthy, and keep learning.